Catherine Bigelow, director of Near Dark. Um, now, you were originally an artist before you became a filmmaker? Mm -hmm. I used to um, paint, and I was living in New York, and it was the mid 70s, and um, just sort of looking for other mediums to use. And stumbled on film, really, kind of backed into it, and started making these short films, and that was the end of painting. It's a very seductive medium. Um, and then the films got longer. <laughs> okay. Um, weren't you in some kind of, like, um, I don't know, uh, performance art group or some kind of art group? That I was working with a, a group called Art and Language, and we weren't using film at the time, really, but it sort of... Um, promoted a shift from painting to writing. Uh, their form of artwork is really, um, has a lot to do with language and analysis of how art functions in a society. It's, it's very analytical. Um, terrific group of people. Now they live in England and that kind of enabled me to explore other avenues and that from that they moved from New York to England. At that point I started making films. So had a lot to do with the kind of making changes. It's very evident in Near Dark is a very conscious use of various darks and shadows and night scenes and all that very painterly. Um, can you articulate at all how your painter's background influences your filmmaking? Um, visuals are uh, come, I'm fairly comfortable and confident about something visually. What I tend to focus on is story and narrative and character. Um, the visuals in Near, Near Dark were very specific. Like I needed the night to be very seductive. I needed that world to be something you sitting in the audience would wa would possibly entertain the idea of entering. It wasn't a horrific, forbidding, gothic night world that, that uh, was very forbidding. It was something that um, perhaps be, be very seductive, a kind of Adam Greenberg, who was my cameraman, who shot Terminator, was, um, we worked a bit extensively in pre-production on what the night should look like, the, the black should be very black, should be, and how we would light it, how it would look, so it would, be, it would be a very seductive look to it, so that was very specific, and that I'm sure had, I'm sure there's some painterly references there. Okay, is this sun coming out, driving us crazy here? Someone's coming right out behind that building. Okay. Um, just, just say something. Okay. Okay. You rolling? Yes, I'm. Okay. Um, you studied with Milos Forman for a little while. Um. Yeah. When I started making short films, I was in New York, and I. I needed a place to cut some footage, and I had run out of money. I was sort of rubbing two pennies together, and um, I thought, I'll have graduate school. So I went to graduate school. I got a scholarship at Columbia University, where they had a tremendous amount of equipment. Um, the, ac the access to equipment was terrific. Are we on? Are we going? Uh, no, I'm just Oh, asking. most of it night for night. Um, there's only one scene that wasn't. All, all the night is night, except when there, she's talking about the stars. That's stage work. Okay. And um, otherwise, it's all night for night. We had about 90% uh, nights. Okay. Well, we need to know. Sunlight. 90, about 90% nights. Yeah. 88. Now she's a little. She's out of it. Yeah, that's just because the camera isn't. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Now, if you just swing around. There. Move the chair left. That's good. I guess just try not to uh, be radical. Shift left. That's fine. Okay. We're still having that. If you could swing a little bit clockwise, counterclockwise. There you go. This looks really quite unforeseen. Mm -hmm. You see that? Uh, Hellraiser. I don't know if Hellraiser is because that opened in France months ago. And what is, do you work with the festival or? No, I work with uh, this French TV show with Surfix Magazine, which is. But they, 
they've got to be working with the festival to know what's in it. Right. What's the uh, zipper in here? Um, can you tell me a little bit about your um, first film, The Loveless, or your first feature? Uh, Loveless is a um, motorcycle movie. Takes place in 1959, starring Willem Dafoe, and um, completely independently financed, very low budget. And I co-wrote and co-directed it with Monty Montgomery. Um, very small film, but I mean, I'm very proud of it. You know, I mean, it's sort of. Um, I could not have done Near Dark without having done that first. It was a great, great experience, and um, it was also kind of the bridge between the art world and sort of mainstream movie making, because um, there's a quality that that has that's that is like one foot in the art world and one foot in sort of independent underground films. So it it's a kind of um, bridges a gap. What little I've read about it, it seems to have the same kind of erratic and kind of rebel outside of society elements that Near Dark have. Yeah, there's definitely some, some elements in common, and the more I look at Near Dark, the more I think about elements in common. I wasn't really conscious of that when I was writing it, but it definitely has to do with fringe elements, kind of these bikers who are sort of anarchists, very much like the outlaws in Near Dark, who are sort of anarchists living outside of society, definitely fringe people have their own system, their own rules, survive by their own system, their own rules, and um, make it work to a certain extent. So there's, there's it's like an anti-hero, you know, I mean, in, that's what Near Dark, I think, kind of has in common with Bonnie and Clyde, is that you have sympathy for these characters. You know, I mean, they're, they are, there's a certain um, horror to their life, but at the same time, you want to take their ride. And that is also the way the Loveless functions. The Willem Dafoe character, who's leader of the of the biker group, is somebody who you you go with. Do you, um, I guess, do you ever think of yourself as uh, some kind of rebel outside of the mainstream consciously, or is it? I, I don't. I'm not conscious. I don't put myself. I don't put myself into it. So um, I don't know. I don't. I don't know if I step back and kind of analyze it from that perspective, but. Um, I am attracted to those characters. Yeah. Um, how did you get together with the, uh, your co-screenwriter? Well, we, um, I had read a script of his, and he had read a script of mine through a mutual friend in the business, and I thought his writing was terrific. And he liked very much my script, and he suggested that we write together because he thought that there was a similar psychology. And um, we started writing some scripts together. It was just a terrific experience, and he's an extraordinary writer, and I was very lucky. Um, and we wrote this on spec and gave it to producer Ed Feldman on a Thursday, and by Monday we had a start date. I mean, it was very, very fast. It just Ed Feldman is an extraordinary producer. He's somebody who just is, is very sure about his decisions and um, is very passionate, and if he wants to make something, he'll make it. So we were very, very lucky. Okay, was it to the basic idea of the vampire outlaw gang, was that your idea first or Eric's idea? It was collaborative completely, all the way through. Um, our thinking was we wanted to take, sort of reinvent the vampire mythology, take all the gothic and trappings, throw them out, and meld it with a western. So what you end up with is a vampire western, and that's sort of the idea that we went in with and I think came away with. Okay. Have you seen the hitcher? Oh, yeah. yeah. What, what do you think of that? I think it's very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, Near Dark has been called kind of classic in the tradition of They Live by Night and Bonnie and Clyde. Um, maybe just a little more about how, I don't know, maybe philosophically, the vampire legends and the legends, the American outlaw spirit kind of in intermingle. Natural. Well, I think those references, like Bonnie and Clyde and Live by Night, were kind of unconscious. You know, it's sort of um, in the sort of noir tradition. You know, you have these characters who are very nihilistic, and the more they try to extract themselves from a, a situation, the deeper em embroiled they become. And that certainly has something to do with the Caleb Colton character at the center of Near Dark. Um, I think really the sense of of embedding that within a vampire mythology. I mean, the vampire mythology is very rich, and it's very erotic, and there are a lot of layers to it that have yet to be explored, and I think the thinking was to sort of update that and um, 
make it really very much of a love story. And at the same time, characters trying to, um, uh, like a rite of passage. In, uh, in a lot of ways, it's also very much about the family, what the family means, either surrogate or regular. Is, is there any particular point you were trying to make? Well, I sort of saw it as, as families fighting to remain intact. You know, they fight very much, and um, fathers fighting for sons. and. And also wanting to um, look at these characters who, are, who I sort of see as modern-day gunslingers as feeders as opposed to killers. They're not psychopathic killers killing for the sake of killing. They're victims of a violent act themselves. They didn't ask to become who and what they are. So in that context, um, that nuclear structure, I mean, they're sort of like a pack of wolves, you know, trying to survive and will survive so long as the family unit stays intact. When that implodes, you have anarchy, and and that's what um, ultimately is their undoing. So in a way, it's a very it's very much of a cautionary tale, pleading for the nuclear family. Okay, um, there are some very violent scenes in the movie, almost cruelly so in places. Do you have any regrets for, or any defenses of the, the violence? Of the well, um, I am interested in in high impact, you know, movie making. I mean, certainly Robocop is a terrific example of that. Just, you know, I, I like to um, feel a kind of an adrenalic response to the screen. Now, violence can, can promote that and can produce that. Um, it definitely catches your attention. I mean, I think film really works as a window into a suspended reality. And I think it's very important that when it works, you're totally transported. And it's you know, you, li your life is put into suspension. Now, violence can be a, a very good interlocutor for that. You know, it can, it can put you on the, on the roller coaster ride very easily. Now, if it creates an appetite for violence, then that's, you know, a questionable um, process. On the other hand, my feeling is, is if it allows you to get out certain tendencies and certain elements of aggression in a, in a vicarious, voyeuristic manner, which is very safe, then it could be therapeutic. Okay. Um, speaking of violence, one of the most memorable sequences in Near Dark is a great uh, motel room shootout sequence. It's um, not only do you have lots of lots of bullets, lots of cuts, but you have every time a shaft of sunlight goes through and hits a vampire, they burn up. Um, that must have been pretty tough to film. Can you tell us a little bit about just how that scene was? Well, you had to work completely backwards on that. You had to um, drill your holes, set your lights, set your squibs, which are your powder charges, wallpaper the wall, and then shoot your scene. So you, you really are, um, and every time you wanted to redo it, I mean, it was a big setup. It was, it was fairly complicated. But, um, I mean, obviously, there's sort of a peck and paw influence. In that, in that scene, although trying to make a twist on the sort of the peck and paw of the Wild Bunch days, um, you know, where the cops, of course, think that they're hurting these people with bullets and they have no idea that it's actually the light that's killing them and they're doing just as much damage as they hoped they would be doing, but in a strange way. It was just, I guess, from a logistical standpoint, it was probably one of the most complicated scenes to shoot. Um, because you had to be very careful and very time consuming, consuming in your setups. And, but uh, w nonetheless, uh, you know, I think we got the desired effect. Was it, um, you just said from logistical it was difficult. Was it to you the, the most difficult aspect of the film to get right, or was there Well, like only insofar it was, it was difficult insofar as you had a long setup time. So it really, you know, it was a sequence that ate time, and you had to be very careful and get it right each time. The only other element I think that was probably time consuming in that way was the smoke effects. To get that right, um, there were like lengthy makeup applications and we had to sort of invent a system that could be used on a minor because up until that point, th to create smoke on film, is fairly you have to combine fairly toxic chemicals which we were not able to do with a minor. So we had to find a sort of quote unquote non-toxic smoke and have it read. And so we used basically tobacco which is less toxic than the chemicals that are usually used, and um, invented this sort of smoking rig with a self-contained pressure unit, which drove smoke through a series of tubes laced underneath prosthetics on the person's body that had holes in them. 
and you had to backlight this, and it had to be under baffled wind, windless conditions. So there was a little bit of setup time in that, and and deal with kids, you know, who I had terrific cast, but. Um, if you're if you've got smoke around your face for any length of period of time, heavy heavy smoke, and you're 11 years old, it can be confusing. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about um, working with some of the cast. Um, three of the the three adult vampires, anyway, uh, are all from the cast of Aliens. Um, was this a, a conscious or just a coincidental? Well, in a funny way, kind of both. I saw Aliens right um, as we were beginning the casting process, and those characters just were indelible images in my mind. I thought the film was brilliant, and um, I'm a big Cameron fan, um, and I thought they would be perfect for those characters. In addition to that, the fact that they had worked in an ensemble, I needed them in an ensemble, the bonding had already taken place, it was really um, a very fortunate situation, you know, that they were individually right and that they had worked as, as an ensemble. So what happened is when they came to Near Dark, that bonding, which had already taken place, was really infectious and the family unit um, came together very quickly. I mean, on and off camera, they were a unit um, together with the other characters. So they were just wonderful. I mean, those are actors, Lance Hendricks and Bill Paxton, who make a director look good. You know, they're very, very good actors. Bill Pack, well, I mean, they both, and uh, Jeanette too. Jeanette Goldstein yeah. is extraordinary. And yeah, they have wonderful scenes. Uh, I guess maybe Bill Paxton kind of stands up because he's, he's just so wild and so crazy. Um, how much How much of something like that, it's very hard to get something like that right, you know, to have someone be that crazy and that menacing without them going too far over and you've balanced it fairly well. Can you just speak a little bit about it? Well, um, that character was a lot of fun, you know, because you could go over the top with him, and yet the thing that Bill has the ability to do is keep it credible. No matter how far he goes, he can keep it credible. He, he has control of that character. It doesn't control him, and it's, it's a terrific process. So um, he was extraordinary to work with, and, and uh, I think the ability to put humor into that film was very, very important with the degree of violence that we had. And the Severin character was the perfect character in which to put the humor because he was not the hero, you know, and you could afford to have him have that range. So um, he's just an extraordinary actor. Okay, we changed it. Yes, we need to change it. Why don't you hold that up again? That's a nice Hmm, that's my film. Yeah, <laughs> Looks familiar. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about the two leads, Adrian Pastar and Jenny Wright? Um, Jenny. The interesting thing about finding those characters is is the requests and requirements of those characters were 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 fairly complicated. For instance, Jenny Wright, who plays May, had to be somebody who kills, yet you retain sympathy for her. And at the same time, the feeding scenes, for instance, all that had to be very credible. And that's very subtle emotional work from an acting standpoint. And um, I saw a lot of people, and the minute I, I saw Jenny, there was nobody else. You know, she was that character. It was like as if that character had sort of appeared. And um, she's extraordinary. She's just such an unbelievable technician. She's been acting since she was 14. and. She's extraordinary. And finding Caleb was yet again, you know, almost as difficult because there's a character who who runs with that group of people, saves their life, yet he re retains his innocence. And um, so again, that kind of subtlety and, and the feeding scenes, you know, all of which he, uh, you know, in my opinion, I think, you know, just, just gave 500% of himself and did an extraordinary job. Um, and he's somebody who's been in a few films, um, Streets of Gold, and a few other pictures. I think he was in Top Gun. I think that was his first film. And um, just has a, a real natural sense. OK. Um, is there anything that we haven't covered about you know, what the 
film basically says about the individual versus the group or the outcast in society or anything? Well, I think um, we've pretty much covered it. The only thing is, is the character of May is somebody who, you know, which is sort of the engine which drives the whole piece forward, and her conflict, which is, is this boy a potential victim or potential companion, and her longings for the day, her not being completely, um, not completely embracing the night and everything the night holds, you know, the sort of forbidden netherworld, is really the engine that drives the whole piece forward, that conflict, and, um, and that's really, the love story is really at the heart of it all. Okay. Um... Were you, I don't know, it's a, it's a pretty good second feature film, and it's got almost across the board uh, critical raves. Were you at all surprised, obviously you were gratified, were, were you at all surprised that, uh, that, that rattling? Yeah. The rattling in the air conditioner? Air conditioner. Um, just, okay, anytime. Okay, so, um, um, obviously you're gratified that it's gotten such a good critical reaction. Are you surprised at all that so many people, uh... Probably. Um, only in so far as I... I kind of didn't allow myself to think about what what the reaction would be. Um, I think that can get confusing. And, uh, I think there's no way you can anticipate how... or what a res the response will be to something. Um, so that was... it was very gratifying. It's a nice surprise. Okay. Um, have you got a next project in the works? A few things pending, and um, something here at Orion, which I hope very much to do in the not too distant future, and um, a few other pieces. So, just it's New Dark has definitely um, opened up a certain kind of access, which is is really terrific. Are you going to like continue writing your own projects? I will. Con yeah, definitely. And also exploring other 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 writers. Um, probably the the thread in common might be um, an interest in sort of a certain kind of adrenaline drive through them and a sort of um, velocity at the heart of them. But um, and exploring characters that. Are unfamiliar. Are we talking when you say adrenaline? Are we talking about more violence or more action type films? Or really well, probably having a kind of impact. I'm in, I'm definitely interested in, in a sort of um, high impact movie making, but at the same time, the most important thing for me is story. And if it's something very gentle and serene and quiet, and it's a terrific story, then that's you know what it will be. But um, but I am interested in, in characters put in a, extreme situations, obsessive situations that um, are unfamiliar. Okay, for the Avoria's crowd, how do you feel about horror movies and science fiction movies? You, I love them. Do you want to keep making those kind of movies exclusively? Uh, uh, probably not exclusively, only because um, I'm interested in trying perhaps as many genres as possible. Um, Sheerly for the sake of exploration, but the thing that's that's so terrific about a horror genre, science fiction, fantasy genre, is anything is possible. Okay, um, been quoted as saying, uh, you don't believe a director should be judged by gender, and that makes sense. Is there anything you think you're doing with Near Dark or with what you might plan to do in the future? Am I alter? either about the industry and public perception of what a fil woman filmmaker is or what she's capable of? Well, I don't know. It's sort of hard for me to stand outside it and to see what changes perhaps that film might be able to make. Um, I certainly hope it opens up the arena for women to enter action. And, um, you know, whereas previous it's, you know, the association of women with sort of more um, emotional material and men with the apparatus, hardware, technique, um, maybe is breaking down and within a few years' time it'll no longer be an issue. You know, who directed what and it'll be, you know, people will be hired based on their strengths and their focus and their inclination. Um, I hope that's the case soon. 
Okay. Okay. Well, that does it for me. Is there anything else you want to say? To folks in France. I think that's it. Thank you. Okay. Well, I thank you.